All right, well, welcome, to folks. We're here to uh, correct the Chapter 6 homework. First of all, just so you know, the Chapter 6 problem sets do have solutions work for individual problems here on the Problem Set Work Answers uh, uh, playlist on YouTube. When you're done correcting, then you go back here to the schedule, and you can find your uh, link right down here. Place your lab, pictures of your lab, take them with your iPad, please, and of your corrected problems, and put them into a shared Google document, and then paste that link into this form right here, and then they'll be corrected. If you're looking ahead, the Chapter 6 quiz is also due later this week, so please take some time and check those out as we go. So let's start with number 17. It says, arrange the following kinds of electromagnetic radiation in order of increasing wavelength. Infrared, green light, red light, radio waves, x-rays, uh, uh, and uh, ultraviolet light. So for this, you need an electromagnetic spectrum chart. And obviously, you'll have one on the test that looks like this. And then you'll have this one on there as well. So both of these types of charts will be available to you on the test. In your textbook, of course, you have a really nice color one. And uh, what makes these confusing many times is that they're backwards of one another. So this one right here uh, has wavelength increasing from left to right. So the wavelength increases this way. And on this one, wavelength increases the other direction. And so on the test, the one that you'll have on the back here, wavelength gets bigger this way. So I'll stick with this one while I'm answering it, although you can certainly look back at the colorful piece right here. So if we look at the shortest wavelength and go to the longest, the shortest wavelength, they're obviously going to be the x-ray area right here. They even have like little pictures of the wave, and you know the distance between the wave is the wavelength. And then there's ultraviolet right here. And then if you're looking at the two colored ones, you can see violet has a shorter wavelength than red. And then you get into the infrared microwave and then the radio waves down here. So the order would be x-ray, UV, green. Green would be right here, and then red. And then we'd be to, uh, um, can't remember, this is radar, I think, and then this was uh, radio waves, I believe, at the end is what, is what they have. So take your, all oh, radio waves are right there at the end. So take your uh, pen and then make sure that you have this order right here and then give yourself plus one if you have that. If you don't have that order correct, then please change your order right now and then you can mark it correct and put plus one and then I'm keeping track of the total number of points right here on this sheet on a tally. And please post up in the chat if I screw that up as we go along. And uh, we'll have a total number of points at the end. Any questions about 17? All right, the next one is number 19. And it says, what is the frequency of radiation that has a wavelength of 10 micrometers, about the size of a bacterium? So there's two ways you can attack this one. The first one is using the electromagnetic spectrum chart. And this is the way to do it if it's a multiple choice question or if it says an approximate value, because you'll get close using this. And then I'll show the mathematical way as well. So this has a, frequent, it has a wavelength of 10 micrometers. So 10 micrometers. Remember, micro means 10 to the negative sixth. So that would be 10 times 10 to the negative sixth meters. And the reason I went to meters is because meters is on this chart right here. And so then I could find 10, to the, 10 times 10 to the negative sixth is actually like 1 times 10 to the negative fifth. And so I could find 1 times 10 to the negative fifth on this chart right here, drop it down right here, and then I could find the frequency. And the frequency, remember, is the Greek letter nu. And it's somewhere between 10 to the 13th and 10 to the 14th. So I'd approximately put it as something times 10 to the 13th. And if it was a multiple choice question, I'd get pretty close to that. So here's the math portion of how to do it. Nu is equal to C over lambda, which uh, you know is one of my favorite chem jokes. So you can uh, use this uh, triangle to solve for anything. So you can always say you know lambda is equal to C over nu, or you could say C is equal to lambda times nu. But you could also go out when you're walking down the hall, ask somebody, what's new? Well, C over lambda is what's new, right? What's new? C over lambda. OK, so anyway, what's new? New is equal to C divided by lambda. So C is 3 times 10 to the eighth meters per second. And then lambda uh, was this number that I had right here, 10 times 10 to the negative sixth meters. It has to be in meters, so the meters cancel with meters. And lo and behold, what did I get? Something times 10 to the 13th. And then the units on that are per second. 
because that's the unit for a hertz. Hertz right down here is measured in per second or one over seconds, or sometimes you see it as seconds to the negative one. So put plus one next to that. Uh, if you use the electromagnetic spectrum chart and had something times 10 to the negative 10 to the 13th and had no work, that's fine. Just put use spectrum chart. Uh, if you didn't, if you did this math, that's great. Please correct the math and give yourself plus one for having that. So two points right there. 19 letter B is a similar question, but this one asks for what is the wavelength of the radiation that has a frequency of 6 times 10 to the 11th and then per second. So now we're going to solve for lambda. Lambda is equal to C over nu, and so C over nu right here. And then here's C, the speed of light, and then here is the frequency, 5 times 10 to the 14th per second. And then notice how seconds cancel with seconds because it's, you're actually going to multiply to the inverse right here. And I showed that meters per second and then seconds over 1 right here so they cancel with each other. And then if you do this math, you end up with 5.4 times 10 to the negative 7th. And if you did it on the uh, electromagnetic spectrum chart, then you'd start with 5.5 times 10 to the 14th. So 10 to the 14th is right here, and 5.5 would be like halfway. So, and then you'd go up here to the wavelength, and it looks like it's going to be uh, for meters times 10 to the negative 6 something. And we ended up with uh, halfway there, so 5 times 10 to the negative 7th, which is just a little bit to the side right here, but it's pretty close. Um, for this one, let's make sure that you have the math done. So if you didn't have the math written out yet, please copy my math down right now and then give yourself a point for showing these units right here. So box these units in and give yourself plus one for showing your work with the units. There is not a point for having the correct answer, but there is a point for boxing in these units, and that'll be an easy thing for me to check, is that you wrote down the units meters per second over one over seconds for the hertz, and put plus one there, and we're up to three possible points. Any questions on 19 so far? Okay, letter C, would the radiation in part A or B be visible to the human eye? So here's one, an EM spectrum chart could becomes really handy. And so we, we looked at both of these already, and this one looks like it's way over here. This one looks like it might be a little closer to the, the, the visible spectrum area, especially if we did the calculation and it came up with 5 times 10 to the negative 7th. We'd be halfway through here, so we'd drop down here, and we'd actually hit this little visible uh, um, word right here. But if you looked on this side right here, uh, and you looked at the wavelengths right down here, you'd see that it gets close to in where this visible light is. And then uh, what's handy is if you can go from meters to nanometers fairly quickly, and um, nanometers are uh, 10 to the negative ninth. And so if we go to this way, we'd have 545 nanometers, because we'd be you know two more to the right. And uh, you can see that it goes from 380 nanometers to 700 nanometers in this chart. And so 500 would be right in the middle there somewhere. Maybe it would be like green or yellow light, something like that. You didn't have to say what color light it was. You just needed to say which one it was. Here's a color chart from the book. And uh, we're at 545 nanometers, which would be right about here. So that'd be kind of the greenish light. Give yourself plus one for saying letter B. That's four possible points. And then letter D, the last one is, what distance does EM radiation travel in 50 microseconds? So we know that all electromagnetic radiation travels at the speed of light, 3 times 10 to the eighth meters per second. And if that's the speed, then we could multiply by the time and the time, the seconds, would cancel with the seconds. But we need to get our seconds not as microseconds, but as real seconds. And we remember that micro is 10 to the negative 6. So actually, it's 50 times 10 to the negative 6 seconds. Notice how the seconds would cancel with the seconds right here. And you end up with 150 times 10 to the second. I just did that part in my head. Um, 
or if you convert that to just regular scientific notation, 1.5 times 10 to the fourth meters. So on this part, you get one point for showing this work that's in parentheses right there. So we're up to five total points. Any questions about 19, about, um, this should say distance right here, not a seat, but distance is equal to the speed times the time. Okay, we're up to five points. We're done with number 19. I'm going to move this one off unless there's other questions. All right, then we're going on to the next problem, which I believe is number 21. Number 21 says a laser pointer emits light at 650 nanometers. What is the frequency of this radiation? And then using figure 6.4, which is this one right here, this colored one, what color is the light? So let's answer that part first because we can just look on here and we can find nanometers right here at the bottom and you can find 650 right here. And so you can see that 650 is going to be red light. And so you should say that it's going to be a red colored um, laser pointer. On the test, if you have to do something like that, you'll have to look on here and you can see that 650, you know, here's 700 and then here is 380. So 650 would probably be somewhere in here. And so if you said red or orangish, you would be absolutely fine because obviously this is in black and white and you're not going to have a color one on the test. Okay, the, the question before that is what is the frequency of this radiation? And so frequency or nu is equal to C over lambda because what's nu? C over lambda. Okay, so take your um, C, which is 3 times 10 to the eighth meters per second and then divide that by the wavelength, but it has to be in meters. So 650 nanometers would be 650 times 10 to the negative ninth, because remember, nano always means negative ninth. Then your meters cancel with your meters, and you end up with 4.6 times 10 to the 14th per second, or seconds to the negative one. For this problem, you earn points for having the units of frequency be either one over seconds or seconds to the negative one. So then I know that you know that those units mean the same thing as HZ. A hertz is a one over second or a per second. And they can be written any one of those three ways and they mean the same thing. So we're up to six possible points. Any questions about 21? All right, the next one then, this one is a long one. This one is uh, number 25. Calculate the energy of a photon of electromagnetic radiation whose frequency is, and then it says calculate the energy of a photon, and then what is the wavelength of radiation of photons. So several different equations in this one. I'm going to do it all the math way right here, although I will show you one time how you could use the electromagnetic spectrum chart to answer some of the questions on it as well. And if you want more details on this one of how to use the EM spectrum chart, I'd really encourage you to take a look at problem number 25 on here. And you can see it took me six minutes to work that problem and explain it and use the EM spectrum chart. So hop on YouTube after this if you want to see a little bit more of number 25 as well. But let's do the math part of it. First of all, Calculate the energy of a photon. So the energy of a photon is equal to H, which is known as Planck's constant, times nu, which is the frequency. So Planck's constant is a number that is given to you on the front information packet of your, of your um, test. And it is equal to 6.626 times 10 to the negative 34th joules times seconds. And then the frequency was 2.9 times 10 to the 14th. And the units on that are 1 over seconds or per second. And so you can see the seconds here will cancel with the seconds here. And you end up with energy in joules of 1.95 times 10 to the negative 14th joules. Now you could do this on the EM spectrum chart. And that's what I'm encouraging you to watch uh, 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 on your own. But 3 times 10 to the 14th, just really quick would be right about here. And then you could drop down here and you could get the energy, which looks like it would be about 10 to the negative 19th or so. 
and look, we got something times 10 to the negative 19th. So you can chuck your answer really quick. Or if it just says approximate, you'd be just fine. For this one, there is uh, one point for the correct answer with units. Seven possible points. Am I doing okay on the number of points? I should have put somebody in charge of that, but hopefully you got. Ho ho hopefully I'm right on set seven points. Post up if I'm not. All right. Letter B then says calculate the energy of a photon of radiation whose wavelength is 413 nanometers. So uh, now we're given a wavelength and. Uh, remember that our equation is C equals lambda times nu. Here's the triangle right here with the top cut off. And so we can solve for nu by saying C over lambda. And then I can substitute this C over lambda in here for nu. And if I do that, then the equation isn't just H nu anymore. It's H times C divided by lambda. And so this equation is actually given to you on the front of your test. So if you're looking at the, I'm, I'm sorry, on your equation sheet for the test. And then they also give you H times C already multiplied together on the uh, front of your, like your cheat sheet for your test. So anyway, here's a little bit of the work that goes along with that. And then H times C, um, I think I have that right here, 4.8 times 10 to the negative 19th, is that, or maybe that's the answer. Um, apologize, my work went all over the place here. But let's do it on the EM spectrum chart for this one, so then we can get close to this. Um, let's see, we have a wavelength of 413 nanometers. So 413 nanometers is right about here. And then if we want to drop down and see our um, energy, we're going to be somewhere around 10 to the negative 18th, maybe a, a hair smaller, maybe a little bit on this side. So some larger number times 10 to the negative 19th approaching that. And I think I got 4.8 times 10 to the negative 19th or 5 times 10 to the negative 19th, which is pretty close. Uh, let's just give one point for this problem, this part B, for writing out this equation. Just having this equation, E equals HC divided by lambda. If you have that equation written out, you earn a point on that. If you don't have that equation written out, write it out right now. Okay, and then the last one, letter C. This one says... Um, what wavelength of radiation has photons of energy 6 times 10 to the negative 19th? So this is another one where we're going to solve for wavelength, and that's equal to H times C divided by E. And it tells us the energy is 6.06 .06 times 10 to the negative 19th. So we put that in for E right here. Notice that's in joules. And then the HC, that's given to us on the, I'll pull one of these out so then people get kind of used to using it. You can see if I zoom in on this really good. Here's H times C, 1.9865 times 10 to the negative 24th. So that's already done for you. So then you don't have to multiply those two together. And then here's E equals HC divided by lambda. Here it's solved for lambda equals HC divided by E. So both those equations are given to you. So you don't have to worry about manipulating those on the test. And those are right on the front page of the data for uh, exam three for you. And you'll get a fresh sheet like this. So um, anyway, we put HC in there, put E in there, and then I think you end up with um, 3.28 times 10 to the negative seventh meters. And it just it, it doesn't say that the wavelength has to be in meters or nanometers, but this is what it would be converted to in nanometers. So let's give, uh, let's give one point for the answer on this in either meters or nanometers. Either way, that'll give you four 
or we're up to nine points total and we're done with number 26. Any questions on that one? Okay, the next problem is number 27. So I've got to go to the top of the page over here for that one. And it says, calculate and compare the energy of a photon of wavelength 3.3 micrometers with that of wavelength 0.154 nanometers. And then use figure 6.4, that's, that's this one right here. It's the one with the colorful wavelength right here. Uh, if you get it on the test, obviously with this or this to use. Uh, use figure 6.4 to identify the region of the EM spectrum for which each belongs. So we want to find the energy. So E is equal to H times nu. And then, of course, nu can be replaced by C over lambda because what's nu? C over lambda. So then the equation becomes E equals HC divided by lambda. And I already showed you where that equation is on here. Here's H and C. And here's E equals HC divided by lambda. So that equation is given to you already. And then we could just approximate it now using the electromagnetic spectrum chart. And so we're given a wavelength of 3.3 times 10 to the negative sixth meters, because that's micro. So 3.3 times 10 to the negative sixth. So that'd be somewhere in here. 3.3 times 10 to the negative 6, a little bit bigger than 10 to the negative 6. So follow that down, and we'd be in this area right here. So it looks like we're a little bit to the left of the visible. We'd probably be in IR. And then the energy there would be somewhere like times 10 to the negative 19th, a little bit bigger than 10 to the negative 19th. So I said it'd be approximately 10 to the negative 19th. And that, that's going to be good enough. It gets us kind of in the infrared area. And let's give points for just using the EM spectrum chart on this one. And so if you approximate it as 10 to the negative 19th and you approximate it as infrared, give yourself plus one point for that. If you didn't, you know, find your spectrum chart. See if you can figure this out. You know, find, find where it goes and then it drops down to right about here. Okay. And then the second one is 0.154 nanometers. So that would be 0.154 times 10 to the negative ninth. Or remember, nanometers are on this chart. So 0.154, you could just find um, 0.154 would be 0.1 right here. And this is 1. So 0.15 would be a little bit to the left right here. It would drop down this way. And so you'd be much higher energy. Oops, I can't draw a straight line there. So it would drop down here. We'd probably be in the X-ray area or so, borderline gamma ray. And we'd be energy-wise of 10 to the negative 15th, something times 10 to the negative 15th, maybe, maybe a little more. And... Uh, I think it ended up being like 2 times 10 to the negative 16th, which is pretty close to that. And you'd be in the x-ray area for that. So saying x-ray area will earn you a point for that. I think I did the math down here for it as well. So if you want to see the actual math, here's the 3.3 here's the, uh, micrometers. And the ends up being 6 times 10 to the negative 20th, pretty close to 10 to the negative 19th. And then here is the 0.154 nanometers, and it ends up being 10 to the negative 15th, which is what I was kind of close to right here. And so this one ends up being in the x-ray area, and this one ended up being in the infrared area. Did I mark down this point for this one? One, two, did I mark down both points for that? I can't remember if I did or not, so I'm stuck at 10 right now. Um, if I forgot to mark that point down, can you post up in the chat? Otherwise, we'll stay with 10. It's 11 now. OK, put one more on there. All right, we're on to the next problem. The next problem is uh, 67. So going forward here, we now get into some application of all this wavelength stuff. And since 
electrons act as waves and particles at the same time, we jump right in and we talk about electrons. So in number 67, it asks, for the given values of the principal quantum number n, how do the energies S, P, D, and F subshells vary for hydrogen and for a many electron atom? So first of all, you know in chemistry how they have like six different words for the same thing? Well, principal quantum number is actually an answer or a solution to a way that they describe where electrons probably are. It is analogous, or it is the same thing, as the period number right here. Each one of these period numbers is what's called a principal quantum number, n. It is also known as the energy level. And so the further you go down in periods on the periodic table, the higher the energy level those outer shell electrons will occupy. They would be in the 5s orbitals right here, which have a much higher energy than these guys in the 2s orbital area. So that's what they mean by principal quantum number, these numbers right here. Okay, And then it says, uh, how do they vary for hydrogen and how do they vary for a many electron atom? Well, when they first came up with a model of a hydrogen atom, remember Bohr did that years ago, Niels Bohr had different energy levels, n equals 1 and n equals 4, uh, but in a particular energy level, he didn't have the s, p, d's, and f's. He didn't have those. He just said that if something is in the fourth energy level, all those electrons have the same energy. So in the hydrogen atom, all electron orbitals are what are called degenerate with one another, meaning that they have the same energy. For a many electron atom now, we got a little bit fancier with that. Now we have sublevels inside of each energy level. And so the 3s energy level is lower energy than the 3p, which is lower energy than the 3d. Uh, there's not a 3f, but if we were in the 4s, the 4f would be of a higher energy than the 4s. So they increase in energy this way. Let's give a point for letter B for saying that when we go in an energy level like 3, the S is a certain energy, P is higher, D is higher than that. So one point for indicating that in a many electron atom, we increase in energy as we go from S, P, D, and F inside a principal quantum number or energy level. So that's 67. The next one is number 73. Number 73 says, what are valence electrons? Well, valence electrons are the outermost shell electrons in any atom. They're the ones used in bonding. And they are the S and the P sublevel electrons in a particular energy level or principal quantum number level. So for example, for something like sulfur, we always say it has six valence electrons because it's electron configuration would be neon and then 3s2 and then p1234, 3p4. And if you add the s and the p electrons together from that, it would be 2 plus 4 or 6. That's why it's in group 16. And so those electrons would be in, involved in bonding for sulfur. So any type of answer like that, saying that the, the S and the P energy level electrons from the highest energy level, uh, saying that they're involved in bonding, would earn one point for that problem. That puts us up to 13 possible points. All right, letter B asks us to what are the core electrons? So the core electrons are anything that is not a valence electron. So for example, here is the electron configuration for the element uh, magnesium. And magnesium would have two valence electrons, and the two valence electrons would be the three S2 electrons right here. 
all these electrons on the inside of it would be called the core electrons. They're the ones inside the valence electrons. That's worth one point. And many times we'll write the core electrons in a shorthand figuration as the noble gas that precedes it. So for magnesium, for example, we'd write neon in brackets like this, and then we'd write 3s2. These would be the core electrons right there. So one point for that. I think I put the point down for that already. Letter C says, what does each box in an orbital diagram represent? So if we were doing an orbital diagram of a, an, an, an element, we would write 2s, and then we'd put one arrow for an up spin and one arrow going for a down spin. And this box, or this line, represents an orbital. It represents an orbital. And the orbital would be spherical shaped if it's an S. If it's P, it would be a dumbbell shaped one. If it was a D, it would be one of those of the five that is kind of a flower shaped one. But each one of those lines or boxes represents an orbital. And if you forgot what an orbital is, here's a picture of what the S orbitals look like. We don't draw a sphere. We just draw a line or a box right here and put one arrow and another arrow going the other direction. This is what the P orbitals look like. Remember, they look like dumbbells. And there's three different ones in three different orientations, the X, the Y, and the Z orientation. And then this is what the uh, D orbitals look like right here. And if you want a picture of the F orbitals, I think I posted those in the bottom of this. I know I emailed them to you. And then I posted them in the bottom right down here where, yeah, here are the F orbitals. And there's seven different ones of those. And then here's all of them right here. Here's the Fs, the Ds, the uh, Ps, and the Ss. That's in your schedule for chapter five and six. Also emailed to every single one of you. So let's see, did we do a point for saying that it's an orbital? I don't think we did, so let's put plus one for saying that the box or the line indicates an orbital. And then is there a letter D for that, 73? What quantity is represented by the half arrows in an orbital diagram? Well, the half arrows represent an electron. So each one of these is an electron. So that's worth one point for saying that it's an electron. And you put one arrow going up for what's called an upspin quantum number, and one for going down for a downspin quantum number. Usually they say plus one half and minus one half. Uh, and then remember, when you have more than one orbital, you put one in each orbital before you pair them up, and they all must be of the same spin before you start to pair them up. All right, that's 73. Any questions on that one? All right, next we're on to 75. 75 says, write the condensed electron configuration for the following atoms using the appropriate noble gas core configuration abbreviations. So the first one we have is cesium. And so cesium is right down here. And so the noble gas preceding that is xenon. So we'd write xenon in brackets. And those would be the core electrons. And then we'd have 6s1. And if we were writing the orbital notation, we'd put one line or one box right there, and we'd put one arrow going one direction. And so it'd be xenon, 6s1. Letter B, we're not going to count a point for that one right now. Uh, letter B is nickel. So nickel preceding it would be the noble gas argon. And then it would be 4s2. And then 3D and count them up. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. And remember, the Ds are always one less than the principal quantum number, or than the energy level right here. So this would be 3D right here. This would be the 4D right here. And then remember, the Fs follow suit in that, and they are actually two less than the quantum number. So this one that actually goes down here, I know it's in the sixth period. It's actually the 4Fs, though. And then this one is the 5Fs. So it actually kind of breaks the rules a little bit, and it's one less energy level number. You can actually see how these fill and what energies are uh, 
by looking at an alpha diagram like this, and you can see there's 1s, 2s, 2p, 3s, 3p, 4s, then the 3d, then the 4p, then the 5 then the 4d, 5p, and it just kind of goes back and forth like that in the alpha diagram. You can also see it on an energy diagram like this. And then there's another diagram like this that shows what order they fill in in a small configuration example right there. You get some of those pieces on your, uh, on, on your test. All right, uh, let's see, we got to nickel being uh, 3D8 for us too. And you can write these in either order. It's just that the fourth energy level is higher than the 3D, even those, the, though these don't fill until after the 4S. Letter C is selenium, and selenium's right here. The preceding noble gas would be argon. So we have argon right here, and then we'd fill the uh, 4S2 right there. We'd fill the 3D10 right there. And then we'd have uh, 3P4. Oh, there should be a 3 in front of this way if I write it like this, because otherwise you think it's 4P. Um, but you could write the 4S before this, and then 3D10, and then 3P1234 right here. That would be absolutely fine. Let's give plus one point for having selenium written correctly. The order, remember, here doesn't make that much difference, just so you know that those would fill first, those would fill next, and these would fill last. So one more point on the chart right here. I think we're up to 17 possible points. Letter D, cadmium. So cadmium's right here on the periodic table. Preceding noble gas is krypton. So we write krypton, and then 4D10 fills, and then also we have uh, 5S2. So whether you put it 5S2 and then 4D10, or the other way around, doesn't really matter. Letter E, uranium. Oh, this is a unique one, and I think I actually have it wrong, uh, what's written on here right now. Uranium's way down here, so it's really unique, and you get a lot of anomalies down here where it doesn't really fill the Aufbau diagram perfectly. But anyway, you'd know it'd fill from here, so going backwards, you'd have radium. So you'd put ra radium, or, or I'm sorry, radon, radon, my bad, radon, RN right here in brackets. And then you'd fill 7S2. And then this is where it gets really interesting is right in this area here. And this is one of the reasons I put this together on email for you and then also in here. If you look at an expanded periodic table and get really picky about this, like right in here, this is a good one. And let's see if I can I can zoom in even more. So if you look right down here, you can see here are the actinides. But you'll notice that these guys stack on top of them. That is 3D1, 4D1, 5D1, 6D1. And so I think the 6D1 fills first. And then it goes 5F1, 5F2, 5F3. I think. Now, I'm, I'm going to check just to make sure. Let's look right down here at the uranium on this particular periodic table because they have all the charts down here. It says 5F3, 6D1, 7S2. Um, yeah, let me move this so then you can see what I'm looking at. Here's a periodic table that has all of them written on it. And maybe I can zoom in good enough so you can see this. Here's uranium's. Uh, come on. The fun of WebEx. Come on. There. Oh, I had it. There it is. Radon. And then 5F3, 61, 7S2. So you can see it. It, those D's actually do fill first. And you can see there's the 6D right there. This one's really anomaly. This is the 6D right here. Look at this one. This is the 6D. This one misses the 6D. So, you know, there's a lot of anomalies down there. And do you have to memorize those? Please don't. Please don't. Just know that there are going to be some anomalies down here, and there's going to be some strangeness going on those. And then to, to get it right on here, it actually would be 7S2, then there'd be a 6D1, and then there'd be a 5F3 on there. Now, will you get one that difficult on the test? No, 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 no. Uh, if you did, both would be allowed because you'd be following the alpha diagram correctly and you wouldn't be expected to know that. But 
let's give a point for that just to see if people were paying attention. And then you actually had 7s2, 6d1, 5f3, plus 1 right there for having the correct one. Um, you could obviously look that up in a textbook or you could Google it as well, but there's no need to memorize that. Just know how the pattern actually works. Last one here for 75 is um, lead. Lead right here, down here, element 82, should have 82 electrons. Xenon is the preceding noble gas. Then it would go 6s2, 4f14, and then we'd have 3d10, and then we'd have 6p12, 6p2. So here's the 6s2, 4f14, 5d10, 6p2. That one, let's also make worth a point because that one could be fair game on a test, something like that. That gets us up to 19 points. Any questions on 75 and the electron configurations? Oh, there was one in here about selenium. Maybe I messed up selenium. 3P4, is, is that not correct? 3P4, selenium right here. Did I say it wrong? I probably said it wrong. It should be uh, 4P1234. Uh, oh, yes, this is 4. I don't know why I put that 3 there. Um, I must have been reading this wrong. That's my apologies. The um, be, being on being on television is like a, make, making me, my mind go crazy. So thank you very much for posting that up. Going back to selenium, it should be argon, and then 3D10 fills right here. The 4S2 fills right here, and then the 4D1234. So it should be 4D4. 4P4. So this is correct. Let me rewrite selenium here. It should be argon, and then it should be 4S2, 3D10, and then 4P4. So that is the selenium one. Thank you very much for posting that up. Uh, another question was, do we need to write the superscript when it is 1? Technically not. Uh, technically not. You, you certainly can. Um, but, you know, like this could just be 6s. Um, you'll see periodic tables write it both ways. And so some people might say that you have to. Some people will say that you don't have to. All right, last problem I think is number 70. No, we have two problems to go. 79 is next. This one says, what is wrong with the following con electron configurations for atoms in their ground states? So if you look at this one, it goes 1s2, 2s2, 3s1. Well, that's not how it fills. It goes 1s2, 2s2, 2p6. Well, you skipped the p's right here. So the problem is, is that they skipped the 2p sublevel. Saying that they skipped the 2p is worth one point. That gets you the point on 79a. 79b. This one right here, neon, well, neon is already in the second energy level right here. And so this would be the 3s and the 3p. Well, it says 2s and 2p. So it is definitely not the 2s and the 2p. And then the last one, a 79c, neon, and then 3s2, 3d5. Well, that's not the order that it fills. Remember, if you're neon here, it goes 3s2. Then it goes 3p6. Then it goes 4s2. Then the 3Ds come into play. So they're like way ahead of themselves on that one by having any 3Ds in there before you filled any of the 3Ps or any of the 4Ss. So out of order for that one. Last one, 102. Uh, let's see, did I put a point down for skipping uh, the 2P right here? Did I mark it down on here already? I can't remember if I did or not. Are we at 20 or 21 points? I'm going to stay with 20, unless I hear something else. Last one, number 102. Using the periodic table as a guide, write the condensed electron configuration and determine the number of paired and unpaired electrons for the ground state. Oh, it just says unpaired electrons for the ground state. So first one is bromine. And so bromine is right here on the periodic table. The preceding noble gas would be argon. So we'd put argon in brackets, and then we'd go 4s2. 3D10, and then we'd go 4P12345. So here is the orbital notation for it. 4S2, 3D10, 4P12345. 
One, two, three, four, five. Remember, it goes one electron in each orbital before they pair up. We have one unpaired electron on there. So one unpaired electron for letter A is just this electron that has, a, in this case, an up spin. It could have a down spin. It wouldn't matter as long as it's paired up with all the other ones in here. Uh, and one unpaired electron for letter A of 102 earns you one point. Now we're up to 21 points. Letter B, gallium. So gallium is located right here. So we'd have argon again. And then we'd have 4s2, 3d10, 4p1. So writing the noble gas configuration right here, 4s2, 3d10. And then in the 4p's, we'd have one unpaired electron. So once again, one unpaired electron in uh, 102b. And then letter C is hafnium. Hafnium is pretty far down on the periodic table right here. And so for this one, we'd have xenon first. Then we'd have 6s2, 4f14. Uh, and then, ooh, this might be an anomaly too. I think we have, um, I think actually we have 5d2, I think is what it's supposed to be. 5d2, yeah. So here's 6s2, 4s14, and then 5d12. So we'd have two unpaired electrons in that hafnium. That's a tricky one. That would be one that would you know, be like a really tough question on the test. Because if you look at it, you might get confused and say, oh, there's 14 of them here, so it'd just be 5d1. Well, you got to remember that this box right here is actually represented by one of these guys right here. I think it's lanthanum. And so one of those is the 5D1. This is the 5D2. OK? So check that guy out right there. Two unpaired electrons. That's the answer to that one. And then letter D, the last one is, um, oh, it's not the last one, I guess, SB. So SB is antimony. And so for this one, we have krypton, 5S2, 4D10, 5P123. So here is the 5P3s right here, which would one in each orbital before they pair up. So there would be three unshared electrons or unpaired electrons right there. That's the fancy word. That's worth one point for letter D. Switching here to the last two, here's bismuth. Bismuth is way down here on the bottom of the periodic table. So it ends up being 6s2, 4f14, 5d10, and then 6p123, three unpaired, shared, unpaired electrons there as well, one in each orbital before they pair up. And then the last one, way down here, Seaborgium, famous scientist Glenn Seaborg. So 7s2, 4f14, and then 6d1234, 6d1234, so we have four unpaired electrons there as well. All right, any questions about any of the problems? That was a long time, but thank you very much for bearing with and learning a lot from the homework problems. At the top of your page, then, you can put the number you got correct out of 22. Hopefully, you earned 22 out of 22, because if you got any wrong, you should fix them. And then you can take pictures of your homework, and then you can submit that. And if you have any more questions, feel free to hang on to the WebEx right now. And you can get any tutoring you want on any problems or anything in the, in the um, practice test. Remember, the practice test has a worked problem sets for it as well. So if you go back here to the LSHS chemistry playlists, you can find here's the chapter five, six practice test playlist. And you can see that all the playlist practice test is worked right here for you as well. And you can check it out. Thank you very much for attending today. Have a wonderful day.